Ladies, I apologize. But that was just too good not to be. <laughs> As we continue this series, Happily Ever After, it somehow seemed appropriate to begin with, uh, with the joke that one of our folks uh, sent me after last Sunday's sermon. And I probably shouldn't mention his name, so I'm not going to do that. But anyway, here's the story. A biker was riding along a California beach when suddenly the sky opened above his head and in a booming voice the Lord said, because you have been faithful to me in all ways, I will grant you one wish. And the biker pulled over and he said, build a bridge to Hawaii so I can ride over anytime I want. And the Lord said, your request is so materialistic. Think of the enormous challenges for such an undertaking. I can do it. But it's hard for me to justify your desire for worldly things. Take a little more time and think of something that would glory and honor me. The biker thought about it for a long time. And finally he said, Lord, I wish that I could understand my wife. I want to know how she feels inside. What she's thinking when she gives me the silent treatment. Why she cries. What she means when she says nothing's wrong. How I can make her truly happy. There was a long pause. And finally the Lord said, do you want that bridge two lanes or four lanes? <laughs> now for a week, everybody tells me about how difficult last Sunday's sermon was when the topic was what women wish men knew about women. But I'm going to confess to you, actually, this morning's subject is far more difficult. Because for me, it's a lot easier to talk to men about how to be a better man. But to talk to women, honestly, I feel totally inadequate and a little bit incompetent because, and this may come as a shock to you, but <clears throat> I've never been a woman. <laughs> and so there are just a lot of things that I'll never know. And so as we approach this subject this morning, I, I want to tell you up front, there are probably some things that I will be insensitive to. And so if I say something that's offensive, it's not meant to be offensive. Yeah, yeah. It's just that male thing. We can be insensitive sometimes when we really don't mean to be. But the Bible does have a lot to say about women and how they are to relate to men, just as the Bible says a lot about men and how they're to relate to women, which we covered last week. And so I realize this message may be better coming from a woman, but my name is on the program and nobody else volunteered to take this topic. And so with fear and trembling, I want to come as a man, on behalf of men, to present our case this morning. Now ladies, I know that as we go through this for the next several minutes, there may be a tendency for you to put up some walls of defense. Because you're probably going to think, yeah, I'd be happy to do that if only he. And I wouldn't have done that if only he. If only he, if only he. And I just want to warn you, if that's the posture that you're going to take, that our time today really is going to be wasted. And nothing in your relationship with your husband, or nothing in your relationship with the man in your life, nothing in your future relationships with men will ever really change. And if you remember what I said to the men last week, it doesn't matter what your spouse is doing. Remember I said that in Christ, we are responsible to be loving, to be faithful, regardless of their response. And if that's true for men, it is also true for women. And so in as sensitive a way as I can, I want to try to explain some aspects of, of masculinity that you need to understand and to explain how it affects our relationship with you and our world and to give you three insights into what men wish women knew about us. Now to try to set the stage for this, I want to go back to the very beginning, to the book of Genesis, because there we find out a great deal about man. And I don't mean mankind, I'm just talking about men. We find out a little bit about how God wired us up in our original state and the way that, that God originally intended for man to function. And what we find in these very first few chapters of Genesis is that there is a theme. In fact, it's the most predominant theme about man in the first few chapters of the Bible. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Now why did God do that? To work it and to take care of it. Why did God put man in the Garden of Eden? To work it. You see, for a long time I thought that work was introduced as a result of sin. I used to think in the Garden of Eden there wasn't any work. They just kind of 
hung out and threw the frisbee and <laughs> had a great time. And all of a sudden we find out that work and man's responsibility to work preceded sin. Work is not the result of sin, because look at what it says, to work it and to take care of it. And all of a sudden, we discover a little insight about men, that God, in the perfect environment, put in man a desire to work, to do something meaningful, to do something creative, to make things and to take care of things. Nowhere in the scripture do you find man saying to God, no, God, I don't want to do that. What you find is God saying your responsibility is to work and to oversee the Garden of Eden and to take care of it. And we hear Adam saying, well, that's what I kind of wanted to do anyway. There was perfect unity in God's assignment and man's responsibility and response. Now let's look at verse 19, a little bit of a different verse, but the same idea. God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Isn't that cool? Whatever the man decided to call every living creature, that was its name. And so God said to Adam, now Adam, you've got to work this thing and oversee it, and part of overseeing it is, I want you to name all the animals. And Adam probably thought, well, what am I supposed to name them? And God said, just name them whatever you want to name them. But what if I get it wrong? You can't get it wrong. I'm delegating this responsibility to you. Just take charge and name those animals. And so I don't know what happened next. Maybe Adam whistled and all the animals lined up and, and Adam got started. And he saw this little thing that kind of buzzed about and he said, I'm going to call that a fly. And then he saw a bird and he said, you know, a fly would have been a good name for that. But I've already used it. So... <laughs> Maybe let's call that wing. No, let's call it bird. And he just kind of went on. He got really creative near the end. He said, let's call that a duck. Now let's call that a, a, a duck-billed platypus. And then he laughed. I mean, I think he had fun with this. So you see, from the very beginning, God kind of put in man this chip that says, now get up there and make things happen. A chip that says, now salute and then go up there and carry out my orders. He just put that in men. Men just have that drive to want to go up there and make things happen. We want to make our mark in the working world. We want to make our mark in our relationship with our wife or with the woman in our world. And if you'll accept that, then a principle surfaces. And let me say it this way. The relationship or environment that makes us men feel most competent will ultimately capture our hearts and possibly our time and attention. The relationship or environment that makes us feel most competent will ultimately capture our heart and possibly our time and attention. Now what I want to do this morning for the rest of our time together is I'd like to suggest, ladies, I want to suggest to you three things that will really draw your husband's heart toward home. Three things you can do to both capture and keep your husband's heart. Now let me warn you in advance, some of these are going to sound silly. But that's just because there's some things about us men that you'll never understand, just like there's some things about you that we won't ever understand. And our minds just work differently from yours, and our hearts are configured or, or wired up differently from yours. But ladies, I want to give you three things that I want to suggest that you can begin to do that will create an environment in your home that will invite your husband to work for and to care for the good of his wife and family. Because I know the way we're wired up. And so here they are, three ways to capture your husband's heart and to keep it at home. Or you could entitle it this way, three things that we desperately need as men because this is the way that God made us. Ready? All right, number one, the first thing you can do, now don't laugh, but the first thing you can do is listen to us. Listen to us. I cannot overemphasize or overestimate the value and the power of a woman listening to to a man. There's incredible power in this, ladies, because who do we normally listen to in our lives? We listen to people who we believe have something important to say. We take our time and we focus our attention on people we think who can help us, people who are smart, who can help us with something that we need help with or to provide an angle that we don't have. And when you get into the habit of listening to your husband and of communicating to him how important you think he is, 
you will capture his attention and his heart. Because we have a deep desire for someone to listen to us. And to listen to us in such a way that they communicate, wow, I think that's a great idea. Wow, I think that's really important. Wow, I've never heard it put quite that way. Now, just to emphasize the importance of this, I want to read something to you. And I hope this is not offensive, and, and let me qualify it first. This came out of Newsweek magazine several years ago, and I kept it. It's written by a woman who is named Melissa Sands. She is the founder of an organization that's called Mistresses Anonymous. And what she basically does is she pairs men up with mistresses. Now, she's not a Christian, obviously, and her perspective on life is way different from ours. And a lot of what she says, I've decided, is just not true. But listen to what she says about the power of listening to a man. Here are her words, quote, Ask any mistress. Her man doesn't do anything but talk endlessly. Mistresses are experts in the art of listening. People think a mistress has some kind of sex manual that keeps men bewitched, but actually what she has is a capacity to listen. Men have mistresses because they have needs they're unable to fulfill in other, their other lives. By needs, I mean the needs to need to communicate. They don't get these needs met at home because they see their wives when they are tired or worried about money or early in the morning when they're both at their worst at all the wrong times. Mistresses, however, see their men when they're at their peak of their day and energy. A married woman makes time for her job, her kids, the PTA, even her mother-in-law, but she does not make special time for her husband. The mistress, however, does." End of quote. Now, a lot of that is garbage. But she's hit on something that honestly I think that you women need to understand, and I cannot overstate the importance of it. Men need to be listened to. Because when you listen, I'm going to talk about how in just a second, but when you listen to us in the right way, what you communicate is you are competent and you are worth listening to. Let me tell you something about how to listen to us. And, and this is strange. And your husband's never going to admit to this. So don't get in the car later and say, is that true? Because I can tell you what he's going to say. He'll say, no, that's not true of me. But it is true of him. He just won't admit it, okay? Ladies, when we talk, we're really not all that interested in your input. <laughs> so don't take that the wrong way. But when we talk, do you know what we want? From you generally when we start talking we want two things we want you to appreciate our struggle and we want you to assure us that we can handle it that's really what we want we want you to appreciate our dilemma and our struggle in the details of our lives and we want you to assure us honey you can handle that you know what we don't want we don't want you to step in and solve our problems but ladies do you know what you do oftentimes you rush in and say well honey here's what you ought to do you ought to go walk into your boss's office tomorrow morning put your fist in his face <laughs> Because you hear us talking, and you think it's an invitation for input, an invitation for you to step in and solve our dilemmas, but that's not what we want. And I'm going to say this. If you're in the habit of always solving your husband's problems when he brings them home, I can tell you there will come a time when he is not going to share them with you anymore because that's not why we share. We open up our lives to you for two things. We want you to assure us that we're capable of handling and we want to know that you can really appreciate our dilemma and our struggle. I do my sermon work at home. We have a little office at the house. And, and preparing messages for me is it's kind of like running a marathon. I mean, it just takes a lot of energy and time. And I get frustrated. I get mad at myself sometimes. And I remember once, not long ago, pushing back from the computer. And I said, I've had it with this. I'm not getting anywhere. I shouldn't be preaching on this. I'm going to have to give it up and preach on something else. Sunday's coming. I'm not going to be ready. I was just pouring out my frustration. And Tyra walked by the office. And she handled it perfectly. She stopped at the door. And I'm going to tell you honestly what she said. She said, Bruce, you're the best preacher I've ever heard in my life. Now, then she just walked on. Now, what did that have to do with my frustration? In that moment, everything. It had everything to do with it. You see, I wasn't saying to her, Tyra, sit down here at this computer and finish this for me. That's not what I was saying. I wasn't inviting her to get involved. She could have taken it that way because what it sounded like I was saying was, I reached a dead in here and I need your help. But she understood that I wasn't asking for her involvement. I just wanted her to appreciate my struggle and I wanted her to respond by saying, Bruce, you can do it. I have no doubts about it. 
You know what I did? I sat back down and I finished that sermon. That's what we want. And you see, if your habit is, as soon as your husband talks, is to jump in and solve his problems and, and answer his questions, think what that communicates. Basically, it communicates this. Honey, I'm smarter than you. If I had your job, I could handle it so much better. If I was in that dilemma, I would know exactly what to do. If I was in that situation, I would have already handled it. You don't need to be so frustrated. You don't need to be so upset. I know the answer. You could have figured this out, but I had to figure it out for you. That's what it communicates. We're really not interested in that kind of input. At some point, we may invite you in at that level. But initially, when we talk, the way to listen is to learn to communicate. Honey, I appreciate your struggle. And honey, I am sure you can handle it. We just need to be listened to. We don't need you to win all of our battles. Just listen to us. Okay, number two. We're going to look at this passage here from Ephesians chapter 5. This is the S word. In fact, I almost titled this sermon the S word. The S word is the submission word. It's the word that most preachers are afraid of these days because it's been abused, it's been taken for granted, it's been interpreted the wrong way. But the second thing you can do, the second thing that we desperately need from you is submit in your marriage to us or to allow us to take care of you and of our family. I want you to look at these verses from Ephesians 5, verse 22. It's in the Bible, so you know this is not just me. Paul says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Why, Paul? Because the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, women, let me try to put submission in a positive light for you. You know what submission really is? The basic idea behind submission is this. When you submit, you quietly invite us to take care of you, our wives, our children, and our families. When you submit to allowing us to take care of our families mentally and in your actions and attitudes, it's a quiet but powerful invitation for us to do what we're already programmed to do. And that is to give ourselves to our wives and families, to lay down our life if we had to. Which means second only to Christ. We put you first in our lives. Ahead of career, ahead of sports, ahead of cars, ahead of golf, ahead of friends, ahead of anything else. You create space for us to partner with you in the leading and the guiding of our marriages and our families. That's what submission is all about. Now, notice Paul doesn't say, men, lead your homes. Men, lead your wives. You notice he never commands men to lead and rule. He only commands women to submit. Here's why. Because when you're willing to follow sometimes, men become such better leaders. <laughs> because remember, it, it's in us to want to lead and to work and to take care of. And we want to move meaningfully into that relationship and lead it in a balanced kind of way. I mean, let's be honest. In, in many households in which I've visited, the women lead in everything. They just take care of everything. And the men are just sort of there. They're sitting on the couch. They may look up and wave every once in a while, but they really don't <laughs> say anything or do anything. But men want to participate in and take care of our wives and our families, not because we're smarter. Lord knows most of you are way smarter than we are. That's not even the issue. In terms of competency and leadership, most of you are far more competent to lead in our homes than we are. That's not even the issue. But, but I'll say this, and I'll put it this way. Men will automatically fill a vacuum if there's a vacuum. But ladies, let me tell you, for many of you, it's just not in you to create that vacuum. Because there's the tendency in the part of a lot of women to just take care of everything, take care of every last thing. And what Paul is saying here in this passage, and we could spend weeks looking at these verses if we wanted to, but what he's saying here is this. Women step back and create a vacuum in some of the ways that you lead your household, that you lead your marriage, and let your husband fill it. Because it is in him to want to take care of you and to help lead your family. <clears throat> Ladies, when you submit, you invite us husbands to become stronger leaders in our marriages and in our families. Did you know that? And that's why the focus from the Bible is on your submission and not our leadership. In the same way, did you notice in this passage that, that Paul says, men, love your wives. He says that in here. 
Verse 25. Why doesn't he say, wives, love your men or love your husbands? Because you women have the love thing down. I mean, you talk about unconditional love. You beat us hands down. God never has to say to a woman, now you women love your husbands unconditionally. That just happens. You're great at that. We're not nearly as good at that. We have to work at that. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, just let go of the steering wheel and invite your husbands to help steer the car and help lead. Now, I've got to be honest. Some of you I know do a great job with this, but I know a lot of women who are so determined they're going to control everything. I know I'm treading on thin ice here, and I don't want to sound chauvinistic, but you know what you do sometimes? Your husband is telling a story publicly, and you're standing there beside and correcting all the wrong details. Have any of you ever done that? You don't raise your hands, that's all right. We were down there on December 12th. Honey, it was December 13th. Oh, oh yeah, that's right, December 13th. We were down there with Tony and Debbie. Honey, it was Trey and Leslie. Oh, yeah, that's right, Trey and Leslie. And the guy's telling the story, and the whole time his wife is correcting the details, correcting the details. You know what she's thinking? She's thinking, if it wasn't for me, he would have gotten this wrong. But you know what he's thinking? She's smarter than I am. You know what everybody else standing around listening is thinking? She's smarter than he is. He can't remember the details. She can and you see, ladies, you think you're doing a good thing, but you know what you're doing in a small way? You're saying, I take care of everything in our household. There are a million ways, ladies, in which you take care. You're not conscious of it, and you don't mean to, but you just take over the relationship. Neither does it have to go all the way over to the other side where your husband becomes a dictator, where you have to do everything I say because I said it. You realize what the Bible says? Wives and husbands have a mutual submission to each other. Spouses love each other sacrificially because marriage is a partnership in which we invite the other to participate in and to partner with us in our marriage. Verse 21 of chapter 5 of Ephesians says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Alright, that's the second one. And the third one, third one is a word we don't hear much about today, but the third one is we need you to admire us. We need you to admire us. The word admire means, and I looked this up in a dictionary, to admire is to wonder at, to marvel at, to esteem, to highly regard, or to take pleasure in. Think about that. To marvel at, to wonder at, to highly esteem, or to take pleasure in. You see, let's, I'm going to be real honest. There's this part of us, that men, that just never grew up out of high school. And we all have this fantasy of doing some great public thing. Usually it's in athletics. We're doing this great public thing and we glance over into the grandstands and we just want to catch one set of eyes and there she sat. And it didn't matter to us how many other people applauded or how great it looked. Her admiration meant more to us than anything else because he knew he had won her heart. You know something else, ladies? We never outgrow that. Never. There's something in every single one of us men, we want to win your admiration. And I've got to tell you, because I do a lot of counseling with people, it is a dangerous, dangerous thing, I've decided, for a man not to feel like he has won or is winning his wife's admiration. Because we never outgrow that high school scenario. We want to win your admiration. We want to know that you admire, that you highly esteem, that you take pleasure in, that you wonder at, that you marvel at something about us. And you need to get in the habit of pushing that button often because you know what happens? If you do that, a man will climb any mountain. He will do anything, slay any dragon. Because if he feels his wife admires him, he'll do anything for his wife if he feels like she admires him. We just crave being in a relationship where someone admires us. And I hate to tell you this, women, but I want to tell you, there are other women out there who will find something to admire about your husband. I know some of you are thinking, not him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, ladies, listen, you are wrong. You are so wrong. Because there is someone out there, she's going to walk up one day, and if you could only be a man for one day, man, I'm not telling too much, but if you could only be a man for one day and experience how it pushes our button when a woman admires something about us. Now, I know, ladies, it's the same thing for you, same thing, but we're just wired so weird, it's just amazing. She doesn't even have to be attractive. But for a woman to come up to us and, and <coughs> someone to come up and say, you know, you explained that so clearly. It just pushes our button. What we want from you, what we crave from you, is for you to push that admiration button often. 
I'm going to take just a minute or two and give you a list of things that really click with us men. Now, now, don't do these on the way home because your husband's just going to know you're only doing it because the preacher said so. But remember <laughs> these and then use them. Okay, here's number one. Appearance. Appearance. Tell us we look good. Now, you know what we're going to do, ladies? We're going to act like it's no big deal. But believe me, it's a big deal. Okay? Number two, our mental capacity. Tell us how smart we are. You're thinking, well, my husband's not very smart. <laughs> yes, he is. He may not be as smart as you, and he may not be as smart as you'd like for him to be, but your husband's smart. Look for ways to say to him, honey, that was really smart. Number three is competence on the job. Because you see, there are people at work who are telling us that we do a good job. We need for you to tell us that we're doing a good job. In fact, ladies, if you want to go overboard with this thing, you need to be able to explain to your friends what it is that your husband does. You'll be amazed how often I'll ask a woman. There was, I was doing a membership class once at a church, and I asked this lady, what does your husband do? And she said, I don't know. It has something to do with phones. And I said, phones? And she said, yeah, I don't know what he does. It has something to do with telephones. And I thought, that poor man, because here's a woman, she doesn't have any clue what her husband does. Now, what does that communicate to her husband? What you do, honey, is not very important, at least not important enough for me to figure it out. Let him know that what he does is important. Number five, his physical strength. I mean, guys like to be told we're strong. We know we're really not strong, but we just like to hear it. You mean you want to screw that light bulb all by yourself? <laughs> <laughs> you can go overboard with it. Don't do things like that, but trust me, you all have that button from the time we're a little boy. Number six, his love for the Lord. Number seven, his athletic ability, his sense of humor, his courage, his way with people, his character. Ladies, you cannot lose pushing these buttons. I'm telling you, you cannot lose. If you get in the habit of pushing these buttons the right way, when that becomes a way of life, your husband will absolutely adore you, and he will be the best husband any woman could ever hope to have. Because he will do anything to be the kind of man that you're telling him that he is. Now, women, I hope I haven't been too hard on you, and I hope you will take this the way that I've meant it. But, but here's what I tell women all the time in counseling. God hasn't called you to change your husband. You know that. God has called you to change you. And part of changing you will result in God changing us. It'll give God room to work in your husband's life. And you will create a home that will capture and keep your husband's heart. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for these principles. And God, I thank you for the Christian women here in this Imagine Church movement and the way that so many of them are just so consistent with these principles. God, I pray for the women here this morning with whom maybe this has struck a chord that maybe we've pushed some buttons in them that would cause them to react and respond. Maybe we've opened some eyes. But I pray that we wouldn't go away today with just a warm, fuzzy feeling, but that you would give them the courage to make whatever changes are necessary and that, God, we men would be invited to move more meaningfully into our homes and into our relationships with our wives. We're going to trust you to do all of that in Jesus' name. Thank you.